everybody um, to uh, this uh, lunchtime seminar. I am delighted to introduce um, Salil Shetty, our speaker today, who's going to speak on India Today, the Hindu right. Now, Salil uh, has a long and illustrious history of working in very various organizations. He was the chief executive of the uh, Action Aid. Um, he's also been a director of the United Nations Millennium Campaign from 2003 to 2010, and after that he's been at the Amnesty International's Secretary General uh, till 2018. At the moment, he holds the position of a senior research fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. Um, Salil is no um, stranger to IDS. He's been on the IDS board and has been here many times. And it's a great pleasure that he's here uh, to speak to us today about a topic that's of much concern uh, to many of us who work on development, which is the rise of uh, the religious right, in this case, the Hindu right. Um, I wanted to make a couple of um, comments before uh, I hand over to Salil. One is, um, obviously, because it's a topic that's um, involving um, much polarization, uh, both in India as well as um, you know over here, I do want to say that um, you know, we're we're treating this as a safe space for raising issues and discussion, and um, and and this should not mean that we're not civil. So let's agree to disagree <laughs> if we have disagreements with the position that uh, Salil puts forward. Um, the other thing to mention is that this session is being recorded. So um, I guess I mean, if there are people who object uh, uh, to the question and answers being recorded, I'm not sure how this works, but just to let you know that it is being recorded. Salim is going to speak for between 20 to 30 minutes, Max. approximately, uh, just to leave enough space for and time for discussion and debate. We'll take a short break at 2 o'clock for those of who uh, need to leave to attend classes, etc. But the discussion will continue till 2.30. So welcome, Salim, and Thank over you. to you. Uh, we will also have, sorry, I mentioned, should have mentioned, we have a discussion. Shandana, who's been working on issues of voter behavior and why voters vote for the way they do in Pakistan, and who's going to be a discussion for about five minutes on um, Sari's presentation. So over to you, Sari. Thank you. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anu, and uh, it's, a, it's a slightly emotional moment for me because, uh, you know, a lot of my learnings and uh, whatever I've done throughout my life has come from people like Robert Chambers and John, so I did the Indian obligatory thing of trying to fall at his feet, but he stopped me from <laughs> his speed at which he stopped me shows how agile and his reflexes are even at this point, so thank you, Robert, for coming. Thank you, Melissa, for... I know that you have other things happening. Thank you for dropping in anyway. And uh, John for inviting me here, and Anu and Shandana and all of you for uh, having me here. Thanks to all of you for making time. I know uh, IDS Sussex, a bit like Harvard Kennedy School right now, is like a candy shop. There's always 10 different things you could do at the same time. So it's difficult to choose which one to go for. So thank you for choosing this candy. Um, <laughs> Uh, I should also, by way of a disclaimer, say at the very outset that, you know, the, the views which I represent on what is happening in India today is, um, it's a, uh, when I say this, I get challenged sometimes, but I actually do believe that it's a minority view. There's not that many people who share uh, this perspective. So, so you don't need to, those of you who don't agree with me, don't need to get super angry because it's a, you know, it's not that many people who feel this way. So <laughs> if you don't agree with me, you're, you're in a good place because most people are on your side. Um, I don't have any, I, I always like to make some disclaimers. I have no party affiliation or, you know, religious affiliation or any affiliation at all. Actually, we spent most of our uh, early decades fighting with the Congress party, which is, you know, I mean, in some ways uh, worse than what we are seeing today. So I would not be making any apologies for <laughs> any of our other political parties. And, and I do st I genuinely believe that actually the problem, the challenges we are facing go far beyond uh, political parties and even political thinking. It's a much deeper set of issues we are confronting. And so that's just giving you some context. 
And I mean, the other thing also is that, you know, what worries me the most in, in terms of what we are facing today is that if you think of the problems that India faces as a country, as, you know, <laughs> Pakistan or South Asian countries generally face, we're all kind of competing to be at the bottom of the human development index. So, you know, we're like 100 and <laughs> uh, I left India in, uh, I w I've been out of India for 23 years. I went back really to kind of join the resistance against what is happening there. And uh, 23 years ago when I left, the, uh, uh, India's position on the human development index was around 135, I don't know, 137. We are exactly around that 135 space after uh, 23 years. I, I went, um, after many years, I went to some of the most remote parts of India, spending time in the villages with the Adivasis, uh, Saharia tribals, etc. And I really felt like I had not gone anywhere for 23 years, the exact same issues. Um, and of course, funnily enough, their problems are the same and our solutions are also the same. You know, no wonder we're not moving forward. So I was sitting with some of the groups who work with them. So, you know, that's the, that is my biggest concern that, you know, we are at the, if you take the gender inequality index, we have 125, 40% of the suicides of women um, in the 15 to 29 age range. You may have read this recent piece of research happened in India. It goes on. We're the 12th most unequal country in the world. Um, so we have 135 in terms of human development index and we have the fourth highest number of billionaires in the world. So we are competing on all the wrong things in the wrong places. And so I, and you know, the, if you take the autocratization index, we, them, all of that, I mean, on all the things which matter, we seem to be going in the wrong direction, but our energies, the country's <coughs> energies are focused on what I think is a totally wrong set of issues, a totally set of polarizing, communalizing issues when we should really focus on the most important things affecting the country. So in terms of, you know, talking about it, uh, often people ask me, you know, that if you take the human rights lens to have this discussion, obviously at the global level, they, if you take the last, uh, you know, 1948 as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and if you compare 1948 and the 70 years, last year was a big celebration, you could say that there was, there's so much to celebrate on improvement. So, you know, we shouldn't only look at the glass half full. Uh, there's been many developments, no question about that. But it's also true that at the global level, the last 15 years, we've seen quite a lot of reversals and backsliding. We can discuss, uh, you know, at leisure as to why it's happened. Uh, I think the war on terror, so-called war on terror, was a very important kind of, you know, turning point for a lot of things. And that's led to a lot of conflicts. And, and as you know, conflicts are where, whenever you have conflicts, then the state is basically not operative. And that's the worst <coughs> set of human rights violations happen. In, conflict zones and from there you get uh, also refugees and the increasing <coughs> pressure on natural resources is another big trigger. Uh, but I'm kind of my discussion today is focusing on the fourth and fifth elements of, uh, of what has happened in terms of taking us backwards in terms of human rights <coughs> crisis. You know, having spent the last eight years heading Amnesty International globally, our uh, primary focus has historically been on fighting uh, authoritarian leaders, military leaders, you know, unelected leaders. So we have found ourselves totally ill-equipped to handle elected dictators. You know, this is a new phenomenon where people actually come into power. Uh, okay, there's a big debate in India as to what happened with the electronic voting machines, etc. But keeping that aside, assuming that they actually got elected using legitimate uh, means, uh, we are now struggling to figure out how do you have an argument with the public who actually agrees with their with what they are talking about you know so i just wanted to kind of frame the discussion within this broader context and um, i think the the way i'm framing the overall discussion is that you know we can't talk about uh, anything in india because india is constantly talking about being the world's largest working democracy etc so i said okay uh, by the way i'm i'm a practitioner i'm not an academic they're gurus on democracy and governance etc here I, i'm taking a lay person's view on this and i'm saying that okay Normally when we say democracy, there are at least some four or five things which, which make democracies what they are. So let's look at what's happened in India over the last five years or six years since certainly this regime is in power in relation to the core elements of what we <coughs> believe a democracy should have. And all of these, I don't need to go through each one. They're obvious things. And I want to take you through each of them individually and talk about where we are. So. Um, 
On the issue of uh, power to the people, now those of you who are, I, I suspect this is a very well informed audience, but um, most of you who are not familiar with India in such detail would also know that, you know, India is principally organized on religion and caste, and caste is really a kind of defining feature of how Indian society is, is structured and, and constructed. So, so we are obsessed with the caste question. So if you're talking about privilege, you know, like is, is power to the people as against power to the privileged, what is the caste composition and religious composition of those who are in decision-making positions become very, very central to any conversation. And across all governments in the history of India, the people who are in power are always the Brahmins, the highest upper, uppermost caste, the Banias and the Kshatriyas to some extent. The top three rungs are always in power in India. So, you know, you can compare this with the Congress regimes and it's not as if there's a dramatic shift, but Having said that, those, of, those people have looked at it more closely. It is quite shocking the extent to which the Brahmins in particular have assumed massive power in this government, whether it's in terms of the cabinet and the highest positions or the next level, which is, you know, India is run by civil servants and uh, this government is very good at hand picking. There may be some Indian civil servants sitting here in this, in this audience, but every single key position that uh, is handpicked, you know, whether you're a vice chancellor of a university or a secretary of a key government, they're all handpicked. So they've removed all the old ones and put uh, their people in place. And that's ended up with, you know, like if we take the civil servants, there's not a single Dalit, which is the lowest caste group person. And there's pretty much no Adivasi or uh, tribal indigenous person in any key post. Uh, similarly with the cabinet, we have, uh, so, and, and when it comes to the parliament and elected representatives, the ruling party did not give a ticket to a single Muslim. Uh, most of you would be aware that India is the second largest Muslim population in the world. We are almost 150, 200 million, it's been possible to get a very accurate number, but you know, we, after Indonesia, we are the second largest Muslim country. So. Um, and yeah, and, and just in terms of, you know, the privilege and power, I, most of you may be aware that uh, all governments in pretty much all countries are bankrolled by corporations in one way or the other, so it's not unique. But what is unique about these people is that there's uh, at least two big business houses to which the Ambani's and the Adani's to whom uh, this government is seen as very closely beholden. In fact, the first uh, 2014 election, our Prime Minister ran the campaign using Adani's aircraft, unashamedly so. We were told that they were paid for the air, uh, for, for the services, but you know, beg pardon? Four, four aircrafts every day at a service to make sure he stays and sleeps in okay. Excellent, so he's got more details. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I look at you every time I make a point of fact. Um, also, I wanted to say that I've realized, I, I was saying to my daughters here that, you know, I did a talk the other day and they, they said, they, they sent, they put an Instagram post and I watched that 30 second video and I realized that I've lapsed back to my Indian ways of talking because I've been out of the country for 23 years, back for the last one year. So I've started speaking at high speed, so which even I find difficult to understand when I'm listening to myself. So please slow me down if the, particularly the non-Indians, the Indians are used to, everybody speaking at the same time at high speed. But for, for the others, please stop me. So that's on the first kind of characteristic, right? And then, uh, yeah, on the question, so if you want a, you know, a big difference between a democracy and a, and a monarchy or a dictatorship is that you're meant to be having a very decentralized, distributed way of decision making. We are in a fascinating position. Pretty much everything is uh, decided in the prime minister's office. Uh, all the other ministries have become mostly irrelevant and now, um, until the May elections that we had, you know, uh, 2.0 of this regime, we had the party president, Amit Shah, who was running the party machinery, but now he's become the home minister. And uh, virtually, our prime minister has become the foreign minister. So he just spends all his time going from country to country. There's not that, and all major decisions are announced, and in the parliament, the show is pretty much run by the Home Minister. So it, what used to be a one-man show in terms of the government has become a two-man show. There's no women in the picture, more or less, who make any serious decisions. And now, so I mean, th that's just, um, there's a lot to be said about kind of cult creation around uh, the Prime Minister himself, but also his uh, plus one, I call him. <coughs> 
Now, uh, this is now getting a bit more uh, detailed, but you know, I, I was trying to list as to what are the kind of normal, when we say democracy and checks and balances, what are the kinds of things that you would expect to see? Now, in terms of parliament, and it's easier to explain to a British audience and an American one because you understand the system of how the parliament functions. So, uh, the, the, or maybe you don't, given the state of the parliament here. <laughs> but, <laughs> But uh, certainly, you know, given that they have a brute majority in the parliament, they, they came back with uh, 303 seats out of 565 or so. So they have a huge uh, absolute majority. So that itself gives them the power to not worry about the parliament. So they control completely the lower house, which is the primary decision. It's like your house of commons here. But even the upper house, they have a reasonable voice. And like, for example, I'm sure we'll come back to the Kashmir question. So the Kashmir decisions were made, it was passed through the two houses of parliament. So despite not having control over the upper house, they are able to bulldoze a lot of, uh, of bills and acts through uh, to pass through both houses. Um, we are expecting that in a year or so they will control both houses, the way things are going right now, because the, the upper house control depends on how many state elections you have won, and they're well on their way. We have the next set of elections happening in the next month or so, and we accept uh, Beg your pardon? Maharashtra, Maharashtra is big. It's a big state, and they expect to sweep that, so that's going to change the the balance but also as you know you know your par parliament is supposed to have checks and balances not just in terms of how many people are there from the opposition but also whether there's you know you have select committees you're supposed to have readings of the bill second readings none of that's happening you know everything just goes through one shot and you know there's no and if it's not likely to go through the parliament it's just done through executive order so so that one's uh, pretty much out i mean the opposition is just a disaster in of its own right. I mean, you don't even need these people for them to be a disaster. So, so we are in a situation where the parliament has just become a, uh, you know, a non-entity for all practical purposes. Uh, the media is a fascinating story, and I think you know, those of you who are in similar countries where you know, because this the phenomenon I'm talking about is not just an India issue. Right now, so many countries in the world are, are facing similar challenges. Uh, so the media is, uh, it's a mix of, you know, either, uh, so, I mean, overall it's almost entirely uh, pro-government or silenced. Um, and this is particularly true of the vernacular, the non-English media. As you know, India has got, you know, 25 or so official languages and, I don't know, 300 or 400 languages in all. Um, English-speaking uh, population is less than 5%, so that matters the least. And the, and the print media is mostly irrelevant because nobody reads and nobody reads in English. So it's really the television which makes the biggest difference. The television is almost entirely on their side. Now, how, why and how on their side are they on their side is the same as in most countries. Number one, through corporate ownership of media. So, you know, since uh, uh, if you want to make money, then you have to be on the side of the government because government advertising is the biggest source of revenue for all media. But if a media house actually decides to uh, act independently, then uh, there will be consequences. So there will be phone calls, there will be income tax raids, uh, enforcement directorate, etc. They will systematically go after you. And what they normally do is a kind of chilling effect. They take on one or two high visibility targets and then the rest. But I should say that uh, my own assessment is that most cases it's not as if the government is asking people to toe the line. The majority of India's media is owned by the upper caste and upper class, so they actually subscribe to this ideology. They actually agree with what this government is doing, this regime is doing. So it doesn't take that much work for them to toe the line, but there is some levels of active censorship and a lot of self-censorship because you know people are just scared. So everybody thinks that we don't want to get into that situation where we have to get a call. So let's just toe the line. I mean. It is, comp I don't know how many of you have, I mean, how many non-Indians in the room have watched an Indian t news channel, an evening show of the, of the Indian, uh, it is just mind-blowing. You, know, you should just watch it because, I mean, it's like, it's like one of those uh, boxing, I don't know, it's like a, it's a blood sport, really. Mm -hmm. so, and so you have these uh, characters who are put on the, on the channels and, you know, everyone's, sh I mean, the Indian thing, everyone's shouting at the same time at high decibel and, and nobody is listening, of course. So that's the media story. I mean, we can talk a lot about. So the media, the critical media have been given names like prostitutes is one name which they've given them. And uh, 
and the trolling is very very systematic if you if you take an anti government line so which takes me to the social media point um you, you would expect that you know social media is more open and democratic because it's not controlled by a corporate house you could say that twitter and facebook and whatsapp are pretty much on the side of the government because they have to survive there but leaving that aside it is an open channel so there is a slightly different story so there because of the resources the gov the the government and the ruling party has and i think just the higher levels of competence they are totally occupying that space and their messaging is much more superior and they have thousands of paid trolls they have troll factories which are functioning by the way there also there are attempts by the opposition to create similar things but they just you know generally incompetent and under resourced so they simply not able to match what is happening from the government side so the judiciary was always a big hope in india in fact it was so because everything else at the state level particularly at the you know we have a national and state level in india the state level judiciaries were quite compromised and state level uh, hope to get justice at the state level was very limited so every single case which matters would go to the supreme court and the supreme court broadly speaking was seen until not so long uh, ago to be reasonably independent and competent now that started slowly degenerating in the last couple of years i don't know if you're aware but i think it's now a year and a half or two years ago that three supreme court or four supreme court four supreme court chief uh, supreme court justices held a press conference in the supreme court complex talking about interference for the first time the independence of the judiciary was the, the justices themselves said that you know we are being compromised um in the uh, and then we have a new chief justice who's just about finishing his term in january this year they disclosed that he's having an affair with uh somebody a staff in the supreme court and and you know one can't draw a direct correlation but since then all the judgments are looking to be very very different from how it used to be before so everything has uh changed in terms of supreme court uh, the classic one is kashmir now um as you may have heard like august 5th is when the the abrogation of the special status all of that was 5th of august today we are in october almost like october 8th and 64 and counting and uh, till today the supreme court has not taken up any of to even hearing the petitions which have been raised against the kashmir thing so obviously you know we we can only deduce that there is some amount of pressure for them and uh, and since the chief justice is about to retire the current one they all normally don't last for more than 6 months to one year they had the last stretch is when they get the supreme court chief justice role and um, we find that you know he's probably not wanting to deal with the awkwardness of to deal with this case so he's just putting it off till he retires uh, so we'll see what happens with that so i mean i can talk for hours on each of these things but i'm trying to keep it short uh, so that's on the a uh, judiciary side uh, and um, finally on the right to information which is a very indian uh, specific thing it was one of the most important legislations which the previous government put into place it was a very powerful <laughs> tool for accountability essentially it means that any member of the public can call on the government to explain why they took the actions they took and to provide information to increase transparency now this government has basically diluted and you know not just the or not just the rti the act but also a lot of processes and the independence of the commissioners i won't go into all the details but essentially that is neutralized so you know very powerful tool which existed for which people fought there was a big movement a right to information movement which some of you may be familiar with and that that has kind of gone in the wrong direction so just to on the next point on individual freedoms um and i i won't take much time because i would like us to have more time on discussing these issues than me giving a long talk but you know i, I think the the one of the right which is the uapa is probably the most dangerous piece of legislation which this government has introduced which is taking us backwards to some of the anti terrorism acts we had in the post emergency period and essentially the state can designate any individual as a terrorist um, and that and basically you're guilty until proven innocent not the other way around which is the normal presumption in any kind of rule of law based society and 180 days of incarceration could follow and absolutely no evidence is needed so this one is they haven't actively started using uapa as far as i know but you know that that's a kind of damocles sword which is hanging over people right now and so that's one thing i wanted to highlight but i mean i'm sure those of you who follow india would know that you know there's a, a 
almost daily attack on all the fundamental freedoms and under one guise or the other, you know, all the basic uh, freedoms as we know it. Um, on the civil society, NGO side, uh, any NGO or civil society who has been critical of the government has been shut down or harassed uh, in a kind of fairly systematic way. I represent one of those, which is Amnesty, of course. Um, they, we are constantly under attack in India right now. They've and, and they have a certain, there's a kind of methodology which they use, which again, a lot of, you know, they've all learned from each other. So the normal methodology is the first thing that happens is there'll be a raid on your organization, uh, enforcement directed or income tax raid. Normally it's financial, not so much substantive. It'll be a financial allegation because in the eyes of the public, then you're seen as somebody who's stolen money and is corrupt. It's not so much about the substance, it's about the character and the kind of integrity of the organization because human rights you can debate about in the country is a good thing, bad thing. But you know, stealing money, everybody thinks is a bad thing, right? We, we, would, we can't disagree with that. So it's normally a financial allegation. So then as soon as a raid happens, and this is a very unique thing in India, I want to kind of touch on another case. So when the raid happens, normally there are television channels, uh, state run, you know, we call them lap dog channels. So those are ready and you know, so you're being filmed and that will be shown live, you know. So, so recently we had an opposition politician who used to be the Home Minister and Finance Minister of India and he was arrested and normally you know governments in my experience with Amnesty all over the world governments do very prominent arrests quietly in the middle of the night these people bring 50 channels to make sure that everybody so actually the arrest is not about arresting him but it's about having that media moment that you know everyone's watching it's a it's a big spectacle so yeah, going back to the methodology, so you delegitimize, and so what happens is, so the enforcement director people will rate, the television channels will say that they have received a leaked report from the enforcement director, which Amnesty has not seen that report, but the lapdog channels have access to that report. Nobody's seen it, and nobody's ever gonna see it, because it doesn't really exist. In, and so when there's not a single piece of paper which is uh, charging you for anything, so then, Normally what happens if you take it to court, it doesn't stand any kind of scrutiny because they, they actually have no evidence. But meanwhile, you're delegitimized. The organization spending years trying to deal with these issues and they make sure that whether it's Greenpeace or Amnesty or all of the ones which are critical of the government are not doing their work anymore because they're busy like dealing with all these issues. And the accounts are frozen. That's the first thing they do. So you can't pay your staff. You can't do your work. So this is kind of, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it, but months and months of harassment, not one case has led to a conviction, not even one so far. But 20,000 um, NGOs have been delicensed in the last few years. So that's the other thing I want to touch on. So, well, I mean, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, the uh, minority rights, protecting minority rights, in because of democracy, particularly a first past the poll system of democracy, uh, is a majoritarian rule essentially. So minority rights become so much more important when you have a first past the post uh, voting system to lead to uh, uh, the regimes are established through that. So minority rights become very important. Uh, and um, all of this data, by the way, is official government data. None of this is, you know, uh, private or NGO data. So this, the data on dal attacks on on Dalits is very substantially increased. Uh, the Attacks on Muslims, I think, are the ones which are most known. It comes out in the press. I'm not going on that. So you have communal incidents, and then particularly this unique thing which is called uh, beef lynching. I don't know if you're all familiar. So beef lynching essentially was that, so you know, the, the general understanding is that Hindus, which actually means mostly upper caste Hindus, don't eat meat. It is true that most Indians don't eat beef anyway. So beef and the cow are seen as a sacred animal. So and the people who do eat beef would be mostly minorities, it'll be Muslims, Christians, and Dalits. A lot of Dalits eat beef. So it's a uh, so if you are seen as taking a cow or a cattle to a, a place where the where the slaughterhouse, uh, then you are attacked by a mob, and and we have had 25 cases of uh, people being killed, literally mob attack and killing. And this is a new methodology they've developed because if you remember what happened in Gujarat in 2002, you know, their estimated thousand Muslims were killed and then there was a lot of pushback and, but now I think they've realized that you don't need to do those mass attacks because social media is so good that this thing goes out to people in hours across the country. And mob lynching is great because you don't know who's actually killed the person. 
because 25 people come, nobody knows who these people are. They're not from the local area normally. They come from outside. So the person's identity is not known. Somebody has uh, done the killing. And now, case after case, the people who are arrested for the mob lynching have been acquitted because they can't actually prove who did the killing. So this is a whole new. Yesterday, by the way, the head of the uh, one of the most important Hindu organizations, RSS, made a statement yesterday that you know India should not talk about lynching because lynching is a Western construct. <laughs> so all of you who are from the West here should take some responsibility for beef lynchings <laughs> in India. So, so yeah, and I mean the attack on the kind of minority rights is kind of systematic. So you may have heard of triple talaq. So you know if you say talaq, talaq, talaq as a Muslim male then you can get rid of your long-standing wife. Um, and, um, and which, I mean, nobody can really disagree with, you know, how awful that system is, that you can do this to a, a woman. But the point really here is that, you know, it's, it's not as if these people are deeply concerned about the rights of Muslim women. They've just picked on this so they can harass Muslim, Muslims as a group. And the actual incidence of triple talaq, I mean, there are people here who, who are working on gender studies, etc. I mean, from my understanding, I mean, if you look at the overall problems that women in India face, triple talaq is not really the highest challenge we are facing. You know, and the proportion of people, uh, Muslim women have facing triple talaq is very small. I mean, we would broadly say it's a bad thing; it should end. But you know, the way these people are doing it is the issue. Similarly, you know, the temple. Now, the, you must have heard of the Ram Mandir temple issue, which has been keeping us occupied. I think was it 1992 that the mosque was brought down yeah so you know and i think even the muslims are so fed up with this thing they're saying just construct the temple and get it over with you know <laughs> because nobody really cares at this point it's just one of those things which they keep bringing up so there can be you know flashpoints so there can be arguments and communalization and polarization so that's going on the next thing the interesting thing is a bit like donald trump's agenda if some of you would remember this that you know i think a month before he won the election he stood up and said what he would do once he gets elected. So he listed everything, and he's just doing those one by one. He tends to talk more than he does, but our government is, it's, everything is their manifesto. So, you know, not one of, so people have actually voted for them to introduce all these things, you know, to build the temple, to scrap the uniform civil code, to remove Kashmir's spatial status. None of this was a surprise. They said they're going to do it. The only difference is they actually do it, you know. It's not like Trump's wall, which is, which we keep waiting for. Um, I mean, there's a lot to be said. So on the Adivasis, on the tribal rights, the dilution of the Forest Rights Act, I won't go into all these details because some of you may not be interested in it. So just to you know, start winding down, I think the, as you know, and this is where I want to talk about the two big things which have happened in the last two, three months. I mean, uh, overall, what the, the constitutional changes will require both houses of uh, parliament, I think, to have two thirds. Uh, approval. I'm looking at those who are constitutional experts, if any, in the room. Is that correct? Two thirds, both, both houses. Voting. Present and voting, two thirds in both houses. Uh, that's not easy, but I think they're inching in that direction. So if they get full control of the upper house, two thirds control, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to what they're going to do with the, with the constitution itself. The thing about this kind of, it's got a fascist model, which is everything is one. So, you know, one country, one leader, one religion, one party, one everything, right? And so, and which in India is like impossible because we are one nothing. You know, we are thousands and millions of everything. So how do you put this country into one? So it's a, one of those things which everyone's jumping out of that box. They keep trying to put it into this one box, and it's a bit of a challenge. So they're going to work on that. We don't know what shape that will take. But the two things which they have done, one, of course, is the removal of the special status of Kashmir. And uh, I mean, this is one of those subjects where, you know, we have more heat on this discussion than any other subject and there's very little light. In fact, uh, one of the media houses did a uh, television kind of interviews of people in Bombay mm -hmm. asking them what is this 370 you know, because that, uh, three, article 370 was the one which they diluted. Apparently they've not scrapped it, they've made it dysfunctional, un unfunctional. So anyway, so these people went to the television cameras asking people what is 370. A lot of people thought that was a bus route number, <laughs> but they felt that it should be scrapped. So nobody knows what it is, but it should be scrapped. <laughs> so a lot of Kashmiris don't know what 370 is. We are in that situation. And actually, the Congress had done enough damage to 370 for decades. So in a sense, it was kind of a fig leaf. But 
it's one of those things which really kind of challenges the identity of the Kashmiris or the people of Kashmir. So you only want to do it in order to provoke them. So, and my own view on the whole Kashmir issue, why this government is after Kashmir, is simply because they want to milk it for the mainland, uh, you know, elections and everything else that they want to do in the mainland. So for those of you who are not familiar with this issue, because it's the othering phenomenon, which is not different from. Uh, you know, the Brexiters' attack on refugees or, the, or Trump's attack on refugees or the right-wing attack on refugees in Europe. So attacking Muslims is the only way to consolidate the Hindu vote because otherwise it's divided by caste. So if you keep saying, you know, and, and the good thing is it's also Pakistan, so we can also we can do two things at the same time. You bash Muslims, you bash Pakistan, and then you get all the votes. And it's time-tested, it works. You know, uh, Rajapaksa did that in Sri Lanka. So it's a kind of a well-tested method, and, and they use that. The one which is lesser known outside is the Citizenship Amendment Act or the NRC process. So we have, particularly in the northeastern state of Assam, we've had an influx of Bangladeshi immigrants for over a long period of time, and it's always been a you know a tense question in that part of the world. It's it's there is a real issue about you know influx from outside, but uh, it's never been communalized in the way it has been now because you know they've always seen as outsiders, but now they're seen as Muslims. And uh, this government has gone through a ma massive process of really trying to sift out the Muslims from the non-Muslims. So they went through a whole <coughs> process of asking for people to present documents to show that they were there before 1971. Now, in that process, they've made a bit of a mess because when the final counting was done, they've discovered that more Hindus don't have documents <laughs> to prove that they're pre-1971 citizens. So now they're a little bit in a slightly difficult situation. They're trying to figure out what to do with this. But uh, Amit Shah and uh, many of the leaders from the current government are consistently saying that this issue of uh, identifying who is an Indian citizen and not is not restricted to Assam. They want to do it all over the country. Now, I was shocked to find out three days ago that they have built a detention center in my city, Bangalore, in Nelamangla, just outside. I never knew that they have done that. There's Nerul in Bombay, a new detention center has been built. But you know, one of the things that people often have, to, they ask, so you know, when you ask about this government, it's like demonetization, right? So first you do it. During that process, they change the objectives and goals about, they keep saying that the reason why we're doing this is X, Y, Z, they had some 10 different objectives. So then you finally don't know what they have done it for and how do you track whether it achieved what it was supposed to achieve. Kashmir is the same, you know, they want to save Kashmiri women, they want to do this, they want to do development, they want to do tourism. So it's a bit like that. So en the end game in what they do is never quite clear. And partly it's a shock or confusion. Anarchy is kind of part of the objective itself. So the NRC process, the citizenship amendment, what is the logical, con where is this going to? Because you can't have millions of people going off to Bangladesh. I mean, Sheikh Hasina was there day before yesterday. Some of you may have seen. <coughs> and they didn't publicly say what the discussion was. They said that, you know, I mean, the Bangladesh Tea statement was, you know, we've expressed our concern. Um, and, but, you know, you, given what's happened with the Rohingyas, you cannot imagine millions of people being sent away and they have nowhere to go to in Bangladesh. But they open this Pandora's box and then leave it there. You know, that's kind of almost a strategy. So, so I think I've uh, probably taken longer than I, I think, uh, I don't know, Shandana is particularly interested in the voter behavior question. So let me just, because I'm often asked as you know what why did I mean how do these people get elected and there's no answer no simple answer to that question but you know I my own take is that I think number one they've created this idea of the majority is minority complex uh, which is beyond comprehension but you know the idea that uh, we the Hindi slogan is called Hindu khatre mein hai, which is that Hindus are at risk now how does 80% plus of the population feel at risk from 10 or 15%, most of whom are very poor and illiterate and you know are amongst the most marginalized sections of society is, is beyond normal imagination. But they've done it very successfully, just like I guess you know, you could go in Sweden and say the refugees are taking all your jobs and there are people who are buying to that argument. So I think the, you know, so they, they present this argument of fear and they say that you know we can, we are your hope. You know we can, we can provide you security. It's a very militarized, uh, very muscular, very male testosterone type of strategy. You know, 55 inch or 56. What is it? 55 or 56 inch chest? 56. 
56. That's the that's the expanse of Modi's chest. So, so he's always saying that he's a male 56 inch chest. Um, so that's the kind of the first thing you know. It's like you create fear and you say that we are here to save you. I mean, so there wasn't anything to be fearful about in the first place, but you create fear and you offer the solution to the fear. And the second is, you know, and this people really under, don't know, a lot of people don't know that they have a machine which is more powerful than anything else. They have six million members in this Hindu uh, sort of militant organization, which uh, some, uh, in fact, significant number of whom are, milit are actually armed as well. Um, it's a very shadowy organization, and you know, you, many of you may have heard in the last week because we had the 150th anniversary of Gandhi's uh, uh, birth, and the person who killed Gandhi, Nathuram Godse, was a very active member of the RSS. So, so we had a, a op-ed in the New York Times last week by a prime minister extolling the virtues of Mahatma Gandhi and how important it is in this new world, uh, which is very different from what they say inside India. Because inside India, we have been told that we should be celebrating Godse, because he is, represents the true India. So, um, and several members of Parliament who are elected in this election are people who stood up in the campaign and said how important Godse was for the country, and and they are not happy with uh, Gandhi at all because he was not so keen on partition. He was kind of you know uh, generally non-communal. Uh, we have a lot of issues about his views on caste, but that's a different discussion. We can come back to that. Um, the fourth element, uh, media I already talked about, so I won't touch on it. But I, I must say that you know the kind of money that they have. I mean, I was quite involved in the elections this time at the ground level. I mean, it's just uh, it's just incomparable. The kind of and in Indian elections, like most elections, are you know bankrolled with lots of money, and there's nothing which you know which you can't. Uh, the micro welfare schemes, particularly the gas. Uh, LPG cylinders and uh, sanitation, the toilets, both of them are very important. Uh, it's not that the previous government had not done it, but these people are very good at connecting what they have done and translating that, you know, taking, uh, claiming uh, kind of the, uh, uh, claiming that they have, they're the ones who gave them the benefit, which they did, but then converting that into votes. So I think that, that was very powerful. We shouldn't underestimate that. Uh, Modi is a brand, a cult. I don't need to go into that more. Um, and then there was a lot of manipulation. You know, we obviously evidence on this is uh, varies depending on what it is. The election commission was basically, you know, they were. Uh, I think they had a name for it, right? I don't know what was it called. I can't remember what. Something they had a different name to the election commission. They were calling it something else. But basically, you know, whenever the opposition said even slightly anything remotely close to violating the election code, they were stopped from campaigning for three days in a week, but we had the senior most people on the ruling party side, you know, they did and said whatever they wanted and got away with it. Uh, the use of the tax authorities, the investigation agencies, the central bank, I mean, uh, and abuse of the central bank. I don't know if you were three central bank governors, three, right? Reserve Bank, yeah. Yeah, yeah central yeah. bank is the Reserve Bank of India and India's. It's the third one now. Yeah, so three of our governors, Raghuram Rajan might be known to some of you. He was the most visible one. But we've had three governors quitting, um, and uh, so yeah, all the institutions are you know uh, have been under constant attack. So I think that you know we have um, a lot of challenges. I, I don't know whether I should show you this. This is super interesting. Should I show you this quickly, or we come back? To we'll wait. Let me stop. Thank you. I'll keep yeah. it really short and I'll take your cue to stand as well so everybody can see me. But it's just a few comments on this incredibly powerful presentation. Um, and it's a few comments essentially to ask why, but also to expand the discussion beyond India um, to other parts of the world and not just next door to Pakistan, but parts of the world that. Uh, sort of countries that lie much further away, but where we are now starting to see a lot of the same types of politics. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's things that are not unfortunately limited to India. So I'm a political scientist. I teach democracy here at IDS. And this is a question that we grapple with in that um, course, but it's something that I grapple with in my um, research all the time, which is really the question 
of why and why is the, all of this happening. And this in particular is a really powerful slide um, in terms of sort of asking the question of where do these forces accumulate their sources of legitimacy, um, their, their, their vote banks essentially. But what it doesn't, what we need to keep asking ourselves and in the research that we're doing is what exactly are voters thinking and why does all of this appeal to them across the world more and more? So in teaching democracy, India has always been an incredibly powerful case for us. It's provided, I mean, it's, it's a vibrant democracy. It's been, it has robust institutions. But at the same time, it has always thrown up these fairly critical and comfortable questions around why, what is the role of democracy with redistribution? And why has that, re um, that democracy and its robustness in India not led to greater redistribution. Now, unfortunately, it's throwing up questions also of the fact that voters may not care as much about that as, as we may otherwise like to believe. Um, so what are the sorts of identity linkages that get formed between parties that function like this in all the ways that Salil has put out in such great detail? And what voters are thinking. So we like to think it's the recession that did it. We like to think it's economic difficulty that did it. But we're essentially seeing very elite parties led by elite groups connecting with poor voters. So how does a poor American voter um, identify with someone who lives essentially in a golden apartment? And how does a Brahmin party end up getting the votes of India's rural poor? Um, or even it's urban poor. And there's some quite powerful work that's now coming out on that of how parties function. And in asking the question about voters, what it really essentially brings us to is newer questions that we can start asking about why parties function, how do parties function in these countries? And, uh, and what are their sources of legitimacy? And there's some really interesting work specifically on the BJP of how it is that an elite party can bring together poor voters, and that's a network, and it points to this network of social welfare organizations that work absolutely at, at the grassroots level, and that fill up gaps that the state creates, but without letting voters question why the state is creating those gaps. And this figure there really shook me when I looked at this presentation, is this one RSS volunteer member for every 20 voters. That's a much closer linkage and a much larger network than anything um, that we've seen before in our study of clientelism what our clientelist networks don't look as sophisticated or extensive as these numbers here. So we're f getting some fairly um, interesting ideas out of this, but what it's essentially leading us is to this idea that the, the emerging democracies of the world have for very long been identified essentially in terms of ethnic voting, religious voting, kinship-based voting. Right? or clientelism, that's about as far as we go. More and more work is now showing us that there is a very strong party identity. Voters have partisan linkages in these countries that we've essentially just classified as either ethnic or clientelistic. Unfortunately, though, we're also seeing this evidence now, which points to the fact that that partisanship is populist and it's leading to populist linkages. And it's not essentially based around questions of development and program, but it's essentially based on these, um, these larger-than-life figures, um, big issues around uh, polar polarization, but polarization based around what kinds of issues. So the fear and the marginalization of privilege, essentially. Privilege groups around the world suddenly fearing that they're being marginalized. And the fact that parties are essentially playing that up. Um, but the numbers don't just hold this in terms of the privileged. The numbers suggest that these, and especially coming from the India election of, two, uh, of 2019, uh, the numbers are bringing together all kinds of groups. It isn't just the elite, but elite voters um, are responding in different ways, and poorer voters are, of course, responding in different ways. And why do we care about populism? We care about populism for a few specific reasons. One, it compromises principles of representation. So what your needs might be are not the needs that the parties are now speaking to. It compromises um, notions of the rule of law. So a lot of them, 
um, depend on questions of the rule of law. They're after corruption. They're trying to create some kind of, of control over, over parts of the population. Maybe the Kashmir issue falls into that as well. But the ideas around control makes the rule of law idea very problematic. But they're quite big on rule of law. And the other reason why we care very much is the shrinkage of civic space that we're now seeing around the world. And what it's essentially leading us to again, not just in India, but across many countries in the world, are, is, is an alliance that we're now seeing, which is the alliance of state, of religion, and money, um, of capital. And this is, not very, this is not the first time we've seen it. In the middle of the last century, these were essentially the sorts of forces that fascism pulled on. It was capital, it was religion, it was the nation, it was the other. And we're suddenly seeing that these kinds of alliances, from Brazil to Turkey to India to the Philippines, are again the sorts of alliances that we're seeing more and more around the world. Um, so the question essentially then is, to what extent in our study of democracy are we really now concerned about how robust our checks and balances are? Do they really stand up to this kinds of politics? And what is the role that citizen, that voters play in the reversal of democracy towards more authoritarian governments? So I leave it as that as just sort of way of opening that up, but thank you so much for this fantastic presentation.